All right, for this week's sermon, I'm going to be doing a request that I had. Uh, somebody sent me a request and they said, what about the situation with cremation? Uh, what is the right thing for a Christian to do, cremation or burial? And uh, to be very honest, I had some mixed emotions on this whole issue. The reason being because um, a couple years ago, I think it was about two, two or three years ago, I guess three years ago now, my grandfather died. He was 98 years old. He was a saved man, and he died. And we had the funeral. They go to some. They went to a big modern mega Babel building, and and uh, just was just you know it wasn't a huge funeral, but it was a you know it was decent. And they had a nice coffin and whatever else. And uh, I thought, oh, you know, probably cost him a couple thousand dollars. And then I heard the actual bill for the whole funeral and the burial and the, everything else, $15,000. And I thought, $15,000? And then I, you know, I've had, part of the, the question was for me, they, were, they had said, you know, um, with the high cost of a funeral, I mean, cremation is a whole lot cheaper. Is it okay for a Christian to, to be cre cremated? And I was thinking to myself, you know, well, what are your options? I mean, you got $15,000 for a funeral or you have right around 1000 to $2,000 for cremation. And I'm thinking, boy, this is kind of a no-brainer, but, you know, it's obviously a lot cheaper to do the cremation thing, but what does the Bible actually say? And so I actually went into this study with the mind of maybe cremation's okay. But I'm going to tell you right now, Cremation is not okay. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture today. I want to show you some very interesting things. This is a very interesting study. One of the, I really enjoyed doing this thing. Really, The Lord really gave me some neat Scriptures here. So we're going to look about this today. We're going to start out with the law of first mention. What's the very first burial in your King James Bible? Genesis chapter 15. Back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 15. We're going to start at uh, verse 13. That's where we're going to start reading. Genesis 15, verse 13. And we're not going to be looking at every reference to burial or so-and-so was buried or whatever. But this is the first one that I could find. And I'm sure, of course, there was burials before this, but this is the first one that's actually... The first time that the word um, buried actually shows up. Okay, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Who was the very first one to say buried? God. And God is actually there telling Abram, later becomes Abraham, but God is actually saying to Abram, you're going to be buried someday. Now, that's pretty significant when you think about that. That you say, what is God's opinion on burial or cremation? Well, the very first you know, of anybody that says anything about what happens after death to the physical body, what should the relatives do? God is the one that makes the instruction there, and he says, you're going to be buried. So I think it's probably a big deal to the Lord. But let's continue here. I'll show you that it, in fact it is. Now go to Genesis 23. Genesis chapter 23, verse 1. Okay, it says here, And Sarah was an hundred and seven and twenty years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abram stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. 
in the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead, none of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat me for to Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give, it, give I it thee, bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land, and he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephraim answered Abraham, saying unto him, My lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, four hundred shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, uh, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field and were in all the borders round about, were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city of his city, excuse me. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, this, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So, what do you see there? Okay, notice a couple things. First of all, you have Abraham at the very beginning there, he buries Sarah after grieving for her and standing beside her dead body. All right? So you can kind of see the origins of the modern day viewing that people will have. All right? I'm going to talk more about that later as we continue. But uh, notice the second thing there. Abraham bought a place to bury her dead body. He bought it from heathen people, people that were not, you know, children of Israel. Heth and the Hittites and things there, they were actually descendants of Ham. So Abraham actually goes to these heathen people and he buys land so that he can bury his wife. Kind of like a burial plot of today. And it's very, very interesting. How much silver did Abraham pay for this burial plot? It says 400 shekels of silver. Now I looked it up online. 400 shekels of silver basically comes out to 145.8 Troy ounces. Okay, that's a well-established uh, measurement of silver today. So, 145.8 troy ounces, and I looked this up on, on the uh, 12th here of this month. Uh, the, the silver price that I looked up was $21.30. It's right around that today, plus or minus a little bit. But 145.8 troy ounces times $21.30 an ounce would come out to $3,105.54. All right. That would have been the equivalent in today's silver of what Abraham would have paid for this field to bury his wife Okay, in the cave. And interestingly, I have here an uh, article. Um, InsureMyBurial.com is the website. How much does a funeral cost? And you go down through here, and you get to burial plot, and they're estimating here, by the way, too, this is not exact measurements. Their burial plot is $4,000. I thought, wow, that's really something. You know, I mean, we're right in the ballpark there of what Abraham actually paid for this land that he buried Sarah, his wife, in. It's still the same today. It's going to cost a couple thousand dollars to buy some land, you know, to, for the burial plot. And this thing breaks down all the different fees, too, by the way. I'll just go over them real quickly here. Um, professional service fee, like you would have your, you know, the, the dead body goes and, and all the embalming and everything, basically. 
is $1,817. A casket, $2,295, which you can get cheaper than that. I'll talk about that later. Embalming, $628. Okay, so I guess the professional service fee would be like the maybe the doctors and pronouncing the body dead and whatever else. Um, other preparations of the body, $200. Funeral service, $450. Viewing service, $395. Forwarding fees, $500. Person driver delivering the body to the cemetery, 275. Transfer of remains to funeral home, 250. Burial plot, 4,000. Grave digging, 600. Grave liner, 1,000. Headstone, 1,500. Funeral announcement, newspaper, 250. For grand total funeral cost estimated from this website here of $14,140. Like I said, that's about what my grandmother paid to have my grandfather buried. And she went through a professional funeral home and everything else there. Which, like I said, we'll be talking about as we continue on here. But uh, go next to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, verse 7. So we see that Abraham had buried Sarah. Now look what happens here. Um, or, uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 7 says... And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, and hundred threescore and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. That's very interesting there too, I think, because I believe what it's saying in, that, in the context of this, I believe he's gathered to his people. In other words, he goes to the saved Jews from the Old Testament there, gathered to his people. He's not just dead and in the ground like the, you know, just goes to the grave like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. But uh, look at verse 9. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. So there again you see the modern day practice of the burial plot, and whoever dies first, the husband or the wife, they're buried, and then the husband or the wife, whoever dies second, they're buried beside them. So again, you see this modern day practice that we have goes the whole way back there to the book of Genesis. Pretty interesting. Okay, now what was the next burial in your Bible that I've been able to find? And of course, there are people being, you know, dying and being buried and stuff here, but I'm talking about the Bible actually saying, you know, what the next burial is. Genesis chapter 35, verse 8. It says here, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alun Bakuth. Alun Bakuth. Okay? Pretty interesting there. She was actually buried under an oak tree. And, you know, uh, there's an old... I remember hearing an old bluegrass song one time, and they said, you know, uh, Go bury me beneath the willow, under the weeping willow tree. You know, I didn't really sing it all that well, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't recommend burying people under trees, but, you know, you see where it basically started there. Interesting. But look at verse 16 there in Genesis chapter 35. It says, And they journeyed from Bethel, and they were but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, see again, she didn't just go into the ground and die and just like an animal. No, her soul was in departing. Her soul was leaving her. As her soul was in departing, now look, for she died... See? That she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Now look at this, verse 20. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. So there you see the foundations for the modern day practice of a headstone. Of putting a stone there. That doesn't mean he had it nicely chiseled and everything, and he had nice her name and her, you know, when she was born, when she died, and a nice little saying with pretty flowers or roses or something. No, it doesn't mean that. He just put a stone there. 
But again, you see this practice of a headstone. Right there is the foundation of it. Very interesting. Next, go to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49, verses 1 and 2. Okay, it says here, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. And again, you're going to see that thing there, that Jacob, God also called him Israel. That's why when you have the time of Jacob's trouble, it means the time of Israel's trouble. Okay? Very interesting there. But he gathers... Jacob gathers his 12 sons together and he says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in, in, your, in the future, basically. Now, But uh, jump down to verse 28. Genesis 49, verse 28. It says here, All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is that their father spake unto them, and blessed them, every one according to his blessing he blessed them. And he charged them, and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. Therefore they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Sorry, there, I meant to say, they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So what do we have here? Here you have the foundation for a family cemetery. Now, way back in the old times, you would have people that had land and they would have a little family, family cemetery plot. You'll still see them dotted around the country here and there. Little homemade gravestones and stuff like that. A lot of times they fall over and whatever. But you would have people burying relatives on their own private land. And uh, here's where it gets interesting. You see, when I was looking into this thing originally of funeral versus cremation, or burial, excuse me, burial versus cremation, I was thinking, man, how can you, how can anybody afford this? And see, you know, you get forced into the thing of having life insurance or burial insurance or something like that because you can't afford to have that much money laying around and who can afford the thing and all this other stuff. I'm not for insurance, okay? There's a lot of problems with that. But the fact of the matter is, in most states, you can still bury people on your own land. Now, there are stipulations and things like that, and you get into the whole thing of do you go to the law or do you just do it or whatever. Again, see, the law is there to enforce punishment of evildoers. All right? If God's given you land and a relative dies and that relative wants to be buried on that land, a lot of times you're going to a government official that this is strange and foreign to them and they're just going to be like, you can't do that or you have to get a permit or we have to come out and make sure it's zoned correctly or some kind of thing. You know, and they said in the, in the it was actually an MSNBC article. I mean, you can look this stuff up on your own if you're interested. But they actually were saying that most states are very lenient. Most states, you can do it. It's perfectly fine to bury a relative on private land. It's, you know, it's something that can be done. And, of course, they suggested, you know, don't, don't bury them near your well. That could create problems. You know, and also don't bury them in a place that there's going to be future construction, like under a power line or something where they might need to bulldoze some land or something. Also makes problems, you know. And, of course, that's a good reason sometimes to bury them, you know, near a tree because, you know, when the tree falls over, well, that might make a problem too, but... <laughs> The point is, use some common sense there. But, I mean, if you want to look into the thing and you want to check out local laws and whatever else and you have some land, you know, some places, of course, they say, I think some states, you have to have at least five acres of land to do this. Other states, you know, not so much so. I was reading people's comments, and the one they were talking about, uh, there was a discussion forum I got on. The point I'm trying to make here, folks, is you can do research into this. But um, if you're, you know, really curious about it, 
there was a discussion forum I was on, and they actually were saying that they went through a funeral home, and it was going to cost them, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to do this thing. And they found out that they could actually do most of the work themselves. There was a, a, a casket maker that could make just a regular pine box for $200 instead of $2,500 or was it $2,295 average cost there according to uh, insuremyburial.com. But, you know, they made a box for $200. They put this woman's mother-in-law in it and they put it in their own vehicle, drove to the land where they were going to, they, they actually bought a, a burial plot and the men of the family dug the hole and, you know, they lowered her down in and stuff like that and it only cost them a few hundred dollars. And it was still, a, they, she said it was still a very beautiful service and everything else. It was, it was a nice thing that they had and a good time of fellowship. But without this thing of going to the funeral parlor scams and having them take you across, basically. You know, there's a, see, there's a bunch of lowly little snakes out there, you know, in the medical establishment when people are faced with a bad situation, when they're faced with tragedy, oftentimes to alleviate their pain, they're willing to pay out more money. See, so the vultures come along and they, they perch in the trees there and they wait and they say, Let's look, let's look for people that are hurting so we can swoop down and grab them. Okay? There's a lot of low snakes out there that do that kind of thing. And, you know, I think it maybe at one point in time, maybe funeral par parlors were a little bit better, you know, in terms of trying to help people and whatever else. But now a lot of them, it's a, it's a huge money-making scam. I mean, $15,000 to get somebody's dead body, bring them into the building, have a ser service, drive them out to a thing, dig a hole and put them in. $15,000 to do that? What a scam. Total scam. It's disgusting. Next we're going to go to 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. Oop. 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. We're going to see another thing about burial here that's pretty interesting. Okay, it says here, Now Samuel was dead, and Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. But notice it says there that he was buried in his own city. So again, you see there, you know, people being buried in their own hometown where they were raised or whatever. Some people like to do that. Some people, they move to a new area and they're buried there, you know. Um, I don't have any plans to go back to Pennsylvania to be buried, you know, if that would happen before I die. You know, the state of Maine is going to be where my dead body is going to be someday if the Lord tarries or if, you know, the devil gets me before I get raptured. You know, I have no intention of going back to Pennsylvania to be buried. But some people do. Some people want to go back to the land of their birth or whatever else. Again, you see the, the foundation in Scripture for that right here. Okay, next we're going to go to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 16. I'll show you another interesting thing here. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12. It says here, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased, diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. If I could preach a whole sermon on that one. Verse 13, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. Very young man here. Verse 14, And they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and divers kinds of spices prepared by the apothecary's art, and they made a very great burning for him. Notice it does not say they made a great burning of him. What was the burning there? I believe it was incense. I believe probably sacrifice animal, you know, they were there in the Old Testament. They were, you know making animal sacrifices and things. I don't believe that they burned his body. 
You say, well, then cremation isn't in the Bible, right? Oh, uh, no, actually, there is a cremation in the Bible. We'll be seeing that here in a little bit. But uh, you say, what about lost people? I mean, you can see the Jews there definitely were burying people. What about lost people? Are they burying people too? Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 10. It says here, and, I, and so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. So even the wicked are being buried here. Okay. Now I'm not saying that all the wicked people out there, all the heathen and things, that, they, that none of them were burning themselves or burning the bodies when they died. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is here, there were wicked people that were being buried. So it's not just, you know, Old Testament Jewish law or something that's going on there. All right, now go to Jeremiah chapter 8. <sighs> Jeremiah 8 verse 1. Okay, it says here, At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. So they were buried, and they're actually exhuming these dead bodies. Verse 2, And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved, and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried, and they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. So you see, there's a sacred thing to being buried and to having your body exhumed and laid out there just to rot. That's actually a great, great shame and a judgment from God. So burial is a good thing. Coming up out of the grave and not being buried there, it's a bad thing. Very, very bad thing, a, a sign of judgment. Jeremiah chapter 16. Jeremiah 16 verses 1 through 7 says here, The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus saith the Lord, Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. So when God is very angry and vengeful upon a people that have sinned, he actually says, you're just going to be, your, your dead body is going to be on the ground and nobody's even going to care about you. You won't be buried. So it's a, it's a very great disgrace to not be buried. Okay? Very great disgrace about that. But you say, was anybody ever burned to death? Is there any record in the Bible of somebody being burned instead of buried? Yes, there is. Turn back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. Ooh. 
Joshua 7, verse 13. We'll start out there. It says, Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Well, there's some instruction in righteousness for a Christian. How can you stand against your enemies and rebuke them for wickedness when you have R-rated movies on your shelves by your TV? And for that matter, how can you condemn people for sodomy when you yourself are entertained by sodomites on television? Do you have accursed things in your home? Do you listen to music that uh, talks of fornication and yet you claim to be against fornication? Do you have uh, books that are using new versions and things like that? Hmm. And not to expose them or whatever else. I'm not saying just for documentation purposes to show people that stuff's wicked. See? Do you have accursed things in your home? Well, then you really aren't going to be too, doing too good fighting against the enemies of the Lord. Very interesting there. But let's jump down to verse 19 in that chapter. Joshua 7, verse 19. Okay, it says here, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done, and hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus, and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylonish garment and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight. Then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his ass, asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones." Burned them with fire. They didn't bury them. Hmm. Verse 26. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. They still covered the body, but they didn't bury it. They burned it. And then those ashes that were there, they heaped a bunch of stones over top of it. Hmm, very interesting. Next we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23 verse... 6 and 7, we'll read that. And this is very instructive too here. It says, But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns, remember that for later, as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands, but the men that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. If you are a son of Belial, basically a son of Satan, where do you go when you die? Cast them in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. You're down, and you burn. Hmm. Very interesting there. But you'll see the thing there of the sons of Belial are as thorns. Remember that. Go next to 2 Kings chapter 23.
2 Kings 23, verse 15 through 20. Okay, here we read. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he brake down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he, spiced, or he spied the sepulchres that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchres and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. And he, then he said, What title is that uh, that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And all the houses... Also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. So these wicked priests that were worshiping in the high places, basically performing pagan types of things and calling it worship of God, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, right. You know, these guys that were wicked like that, he said, you take their bones out of those sepulchers, out of these tombs, basically, and you burn them upon the altar. But that one guy there, that man of God that prophesied that this bad stuff was going to happen, that we were going to get rid of these wicked people, he said, leave that guy's bones alone. So, is it a good thing to have your bones burnt? And by the way, if you go to a crematorium, um, most crematoriums, the bones don't get burned up. They actually have to grind the bones up. All right, that's another part of the thing. And by the way, uh, you say, well, I still think a crematorium is pretty cheap compared to a burial. Well, there are other costs that can come into that. All right, there are certain things. If you have a pacemaker or um, other types of uh, implanted things in your body, types of surgical implants, I'm not talking Mark of the Beast or something. You know, I'm talking about you know, uh, artificial things or whatever in your body, those things have to actually be removed before the crematorium will accept your dead body. So that can take the cost up, you know, quite a bit too. So uh, even a cremation can get very, very expensive. And you still a lot of times have the all the funeral service and everything else which you have to pay for. So cremation is not, you know, not good according to the pages of scripture but it also isn't really as cheap as some people think depending on the situation but you see there again this thing of burning being a very negative thing go next to, next to Psalm 106 Psalm 106 Psalm 106, verse 17 and 18. It says here, The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. And a fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. All right. And this is talking about uh, verse 16 there. It says, They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. All right. So basically when Moses is coming down, I believe in context here, when he's coming down, off the mountain after receiving the Ten Commandments and he hears the people having a wild party down there worshiping the golden calf and all that stuff, you know, throwing a modern-day charismatic worship service. And uh, I had to throw that in there. And, you know, this all this stuff is going on there and he says, who's on the Lord's side? Let them come on to me. And they, a bunch of people come over and he goes, okay, you know, go kill them and things. You know, you have that story. I think that was where the thing, you know, the earth, maybe that was another time, the earth opens up the people drop down into the fire, kind of like cremation. Is it a good thing to be burned like that? No. When people are being burned, it's a sign of God's judgment, God's wrath. When people are not being buried, it's a sign of His judgment. Again, His wrath, like we read over there in the book of Jeremiah. So burial is a thing that is very strongly... You know, that we're supposed to be doing that. But let's continue here. 
We're going to go next to Isaiah 33, verse 12. Isaiah 33, verse 12. It says here, And the people shall be as the burnings of lime, as thorns, remember the sons of Belial? Thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. Again, you see a passage talking about judgment and people being burned in the fire. So, is it okay to be cremated? I don't think so. I think it's a bad idea. Very bad idea. Go to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43 verses 1 and 2 says here, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. See what I was talking about earlier? Jacob and Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So again, you see righteous people, flames aren't coming upon them. Fire's not being kindled by them. So why then, after death, is it okay to be cremated? Uh-uh. And of course, you know, what's a really good example of that thing there? thing about flame not coming upon people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. Again, you, you see this thing here over and over and over again of saved people that are righteous and are in line with the Lord. It's like you stay away from fire. You stay away from your body being burned. But when there's wickedness and judgment and wrath from God coming upon people, then they're burned. I don't believe in cremation. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't really know which way to go on this thing until I did this study. And it's like, it is crystal clear, you're to be buried and not burned. But we'll continue. Go to Ezekiel chapter 24. Ezekiel 24, verse 9 and 10. Ezekiel 24, verse 9. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, I will make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Did he say, uh, hey, hello, hello to the righteous city? Uh-uh. Woe to the bloody city. Again, God's judgment. But it sounds basically like a cremation there. In verse 10, heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh. Spice it well, let the bones be burned. And again, you know, there again you have the pagans with their bone fires, called today bonfires, you know. And they would burn people alive or whatever, and then they would see the way the, 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 the body died and the skeleton and stuff in the ashes. And it would signal good crops, bad crops, or whatever else the pagans were trying to find out. You know, so again, you see this thing of, and we're not even going to get into the, all the historical stuff, who was burning, you know, and what pagan countries, you know, do this stuff. I know the Hindus are big onto the thing. They used to have the thing of Sati, uh, where they would actually have a guy would die, and they would take his living wife, you know, the widow, and they'd burn her with him, you know, and William Carey was instrumental in, in ending this wicked practice of sati. Uh, but you have this thing of the Hindu belief system is that you're reincarnated. So, you know, you don't want to be sticking around with that body for very long, so you want to get rid of the body quick so it can be reincarnated as a butterfly or a caterpillar or something, you know. And, you know, so they would burn the bodies. So you have pagan people and burning bodies, and you have God's judgment. Again, there's just no excuse for being cremated as a Christian. It's just not in there. Especially when there are options with the thing of burial. You know, like again, I, I said, I, you know, I can't do all the research. You're going to have to look into that thing if you're interested. But there are ways that you can bury yourself or, or relatives or whatever on private land. 
right? There are ways to do that. There are, there are things that you can check into. Something to think about. Even if you get a burial plot someplace in a cemetery, there are still cheaper ways to go about having a funeral. You know, I remember back in the old days, I know a lot of the Amish from where I'm from, down Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, a lot of the Amish would have funerals in their living room. They'd take the dead body of the relative, they'd put it into a wooden box that they would make, a wooden casket, and they would have people come in and they'd have a little funeral service there and they'd take the body out and bury it. See? That's the way it was always done. Again, when you have things getting wicked, you go and you ask for the old paths. And you say to yourself, if people did this for thousands of years, and now, now all of a sudden I'm told I can't do it, we're not allowed to do it, you have to ask yourself, why? If it worked for people back then, why doesn't it work for us today? Okay. Now we're going to go next to Amos, the book of Amos, chapter 2. Amos chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Amos 2 verse 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kirioth, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst thereof, and will slay all the princes thereof with him, saith the Lord. So, again, you know, he burned the bones of the king of Edom uh, into lime. See, it's a bad thing. Again, it's judgment. You don't see this thing of, oh, it's, you know, they burned the bones and it was really wonderful and righteous. No, it's, it's always a bad thing. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. Verse uh, 36, Matthew 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reaper, reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The tares are wicked and they're burned. Hmm. Verse 41, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth, forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear. Let him hear. Interesting, because if you go to a crematorium, it is a furnace of fire. You can look up pictures of that thing online. It's a long kind of a furnace thing, and usually it's propane powered, the more modern ones. The old ones, they'd pile up a whole bunch of wood and then burn the body on top of that. But a crematorium is a furnace of fire. Right there, it's talking about the wicked being cast into a furnace of fire, and they're going to be burned. Now, the furnace of fire that these wicked are cast into is right under your feet. Okay, it's not a long rectangular tube. It's a big circle. It's a big sphere. All right, and the heart of that circle is hell. Interesting. Go next to Luke 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. All right, Luke 3, verse 16 and 17 says, John answered, saying unto, them all, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, a lot of people stop right there and they say, see, the, whole, the baptism of the Holy Ghost with fire, you know. No, no, no. It's not the same baptism. It's two different ones. You say, how can you prove that? By reading further, 
Verse 17, whose fan is in his hand and he will throughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. Look at this. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Same thing we just read about over there in Matthew chapter 13. That's what's going on there. The chaff, the wicked, he will burn with fire unquenchable. This is not the Holy Ghost, fire of the Holy Ghost comes down. Uh-uh. There are two different baptisms there. The saved are baptized with the Holy Ghost. The lost are baptized in the fires of hell. By full immersion, you know, not just pouring on the head. <laughs> you know, full immersion in the fires of hell. It's really something. Hebrews 6, verse 7. And again, you know, you see there in the book of Luke and in the book of Matthew, the wicked are being burned. You really can't find much justification for this thing of, you know, burning a Christian after death. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Okay, it says here, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns, remember the thorns? The sons of Belial are like thorns. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Not buried, burned. I remember back when I was in Pennsylvania, my wife and I, we would go out berry picking up where, you know, you'd see the old videos of us up on top of the hill and things and, you know, you'd see the valley behind me and everything. There was a weed there called Mile a Minute Weed. We just called it M&M &M Weed for short. But, uh, you know, it was this weed. It had these old triangular leaves, and it had these little tiny prickly briars. And the thing just, oh, it was everywhere. It literally grew a mile a minute. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, this stuff, horrible weed, very, very invasive. It's uh, listed as a noxious weed, meaning it takes over everything. But this stuff, the best way to get rid of it was to gather it into bundles because it, it would stick, it was so sticky it'd stick to itself. And you just rip it off with gloves on. You didn't want to try to do it without gloves. But you'd rip this stuff off, put it into a big bundle, and just take it and throw it right into the fire. That's a picture of the lost world. According to Scripture, the sons of Belial. Why? They stick together. And they'll try to prick you and poke you and cause you to bleed. <laughs> they'll try to come after you. And they all stick together. And they'll grow over everything and crowd out everything that's good. The desire of sinful people is to not have Christians around to convict them of their sin. That's why they say, don't force your religion down my throat. You know, don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? See, they stick together. They want all thorns in that patch. They don't want good plants in with them. And the rapture is going to be the very first time in history, outside of the flood in the days of Noah, it's going to be the very first, I should say the second time then, second time in history when all the, the righteous are removed. Well, actually, no, it, it would actually be the first time then, thinking of it that way, the very first time in history when all the righteous are leaving and only wicked people are left. When the rapture happens, there will only be lost people here on the earth. You think of the problem that's going to create. You think of the wickedness that they're going to get away with. Nobody's going to stand up against it. Wow. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. But, uh, you know, there's a question that comes up. You say, well, you know, okay, I'm seeing, you know, Christians should be buried, certainly. But what about the martyrs that were burned at the stake? What about those? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. First Corinthians 13. Okay, let's begin here in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. 
Hmm. Though I give my body to be burned, and I'm not charity. Very good instruction there. Why are you out there fighting for Jesus Christ? Do you have charity? Are you trying to put on a show and get people to pat you on the back? Or do you really care about the lost world? Do you have charity? Sacrificial love for the lost people out there. It's very important. But you say, okay, if you give your body to be burned and they burn you, that's an honorable death. You die the death of a martyr, so see you're being burned, therefore cremation is okay, right? No, because it's not voluntary burning. The martyrs are not saying, could you please burn me to death? It's the lost world burning a Christian. But by the way, it's interesting there, another way that you could actually look at this passage here, he says, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. There's another way to look at that thing. There could be the thing of the being martyred and burned at the stake, but Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4 says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. If you're accursed from Christ, you're going down there, going to hell. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises... Question, would you be willing to lose your own soul and go to hell if it meant the salvation of the Jewish people? Do you love them that much? Wow. Paul did. It's really something. That's called charity. Self-sacrificial love. And what greater sacrifice could there be than you going to hell and burning for those people? And, of course, you know, if you would go to hell, it wouldn't mean the salvation of Israel. But, you know, Paul was saying he was demonstrating his love was so great for these people, for these Jewish people, that he would have been willing to go to hell and burn if it had meant the salvation of those people. That is charity. Let me just make a, another point here. Let's read a few more verses. Verse 4 through 7 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says... Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You know, a recent video that I made rebuking Greg Miller. Uh, these passages, or this passage right here, kind of really summed up some of the problems that I had. His comments were not charitable. And there were some other brethren that their comments weren't charitable either. But the difference is, the other brethren apologized. As of yet, Greg Miller hasn't. See, some of you, and I want to commend you out there, if you believe in the gap theory and you went a little bit too far, you got caught up in the spirit there of, of this fighting and attacking one another, and you've come out and you've said, you know, I'm not backing off in my belief in the gap theory, but I am sorry for going too far. I want to commend you for that. I appreciate that. I really do. And I know plenty of brethren that believe in the gap theory. And I don't consider them to be heretics for it. I don't agree with the gap theory, and I never will. I'll be very honest with you. I've looked at the arguments. I explained all that stuff already, and I'm not trying to get the thing going again. Good night. You know, let's not start the comment deal again. But the point is, we need to have charity. And when we disagree with brethren over issues, we need to keep it charitable. I know the flesh can rise up. I know you get angry and things like that. I get angry. You see me saying things, I get mad, and sometimes I get a little bit, you know, forceful, and I maybe I shouldn't sometimes. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far, you know. Sometimes, yes, you have the times when you have the Pharisees and, and things out there, and you have the money changers in the temple, and you have to go in and do a little whipping. That's there, all right? You know, sometimes you have to say the Cretans are always, you know, evil beasts, slow bellies, you know, rebuke them sharply, you know. Sometimes that's there, but other times, make sure that you have charity. 
Charity is the bond of perfectness. All right. This chapter here, 1 Corinthians 13, is one of the most important in the New Testament because it gives you the motivation for service. Make sure that you have char charity and make sure that you are being kind to the brethren. All right? You, if you want to be nasty with people, there are plenty of atheists and unrepentant sodomites and new perversionists with the Alexandrian school of thought in their mind there are plenty of those people out there, hardcore Roman Catholics, Muslims, whoever. There's plenty of them that you can fight with. But for crying out loud, don't fight with the brethren. All right? Just needed to put a little thing in there. But let me ask you a question. How is God going to get revenge on the Roman Catholic cult? Okay, because you had the Roman Catholics that were burning the martyrs. And again, you can't use the martyr argument to support cremation because it was the Roman Catholics, it was wicked people that were burning the Christians. It was not them consenting to say, I'd like to be burned because it'll save me money on burial expenses. Revelation chapter 18. One of the attributes about the Lord that I love very dearly is the fact that he has a tremendous sense of irony. And a lot of times the Lord will do things to people. He'll pay them back according to the sin that they did in their life. Okay. They sow to the flesh and to the flesh they reap corruption. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 through 10. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker, partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Oh, God is ever loving. He's, he just loves everybody and His love is unconditional. Well, that's true if you're saved. If you're not saved, you got problems. God will remember. Verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be buried with a nice burial and a nice plot in a cemetery. doesn't say that. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong as the Lord God who judgeth her, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they see, shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, 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 that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So you see again another example of burning being God's judgment. It's interesting, too, because in the Old Testament you had the whole system of animal sacrifices and they were burning animals on the altar. Why were they burning them? Because the animal was taking the sins of the people and being burned for it. And if you die in your sins, you burn. Again, why would a Christian, a saved, redeemed, born-again Christian, want to burn themselves after death? I don't recommend it, folks. Now, should we as Christians be buried at death? Acts chapter 5. A couple more places to turn to here. And then we'll be done for today. It's getting pretty late at night here, so I'm a little bit... a little out of it. Hopefully I'm not yawning or acting too tired. Acts chapter 5, verse 5 through 11 says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. Now, there's a lot of debate whether or not Ananias and Sapphira were, Sapphira were saved, you know, um, you know, whether or not they were. The point is, they're still buried. But let's continue here. 
Verse 7, And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and as many as heard these things. So again, you see the thing of these people are being buried, and it's being, they're being buried husband and wife, side by side. And I think that that's the way it should be yet today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There's a lot of other places we could go to, but uh, I think the Bible is pretty clear on the subject of cremation versus burial. Cremation is not an option. Burial is the biblical way to go. You say, why is that? Well, we're supposed to be Christ-like, aren't we? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You want to be Christ-like? Then be buried when you die. I think that that's the way it's supposed to be. I'll show you another reason for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. You can go down there. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. O grave, where is thy victory? Buried saints coming up at the rapture. Not burned and their ashes scattered into the wind or some pretty place like that. Buried. Question is, cremation or burial? Burial. You say, Brother Brian, it's too expensive. Then find an alternative. Look into ways to bury relatives, or even if you're planning your own funeral, look into ways to have yourself buried on land, private land someplace. Or if you get a burial plot somewhere in a cemetery, look into ways to make things cheaper. And I realize, I realize, you know, again, brethren, we are in a very, very corrupt system, and I understand that. And some people have already gotten themselves, you know, burial insurance and whatever else and all that stuff. And you're like, man, how am I going to get out of this thing? We have all been scammed at some point in time in our lives. We have all been led astray by this modern system. And I know sometimes it's very difficult to get out of that stuff. But you know what? If the Lord is convicting you of this thing and the Lord is showing you, yeah, the Bible is very clear. Burial is the only thing that's supposed to be there. Then do what you can and to get yourself right with the biblical system and God will reward you for it. Even if it means you lose some money as a result. All right? I'm telling you right now, when you see things that are wrong and you try to undo it, it's not about that we're going to bring back a massive revival and we're going to make everything happen and you know, you know, we're going to go back to the right way and that isn't what it's about. What it's about is when God sees you getting rid of things that you shouldn't have, certain types of insurance and things like that, when you are doing that, God will see that you are making an effort to live according to the truths of His Word and He will bless you for that. 
I've seen it happen in my own life. I mean, I was pretty much a failure for most of my life. You know, people, oh, you're a preacher now and everything else, and, you know, God's blessed me through your ministry, and I'm always glad to hear that. But the fact is, most of my life, I've, I've wasted, I've ruined. Up until two years ago, I was eating fast food. My health was horrible. I couldn't even eat raw fruits and vegetables. I mean, you are not looking at a success story that I've been a, just a wonderful person all my life. All right, it's only recently that I've really cleaned up my life, you know, and a lot of it came after I got married. So do what you can, brethren, all right? If you have made plans to go through an expensive funeral home and things like that, and it's going to cost a lot of money, and you got some kind of insurance thing on it, and I'd try very hard to get out of that. Do what you can to get out of that. If you've been planning to be cremated, definitely do what you can to get out of that. But let me just say this in closing. I don't think most of us are ever going to see the grave. You know, I've been saying this thing for years, and I'm never going to quit saying it. And that is, I believe the rapture is imminent. <laughs> okay, I think we're getting very, very, very close. Extremely close. I mean, you know, the, the old saying is, you know, you're driving down the highway and you want to go to, you know, I want to go to Florida, and I am driving along and I see signs for New York. Well, I'm not. You know, or I, well, I rather I should say, I want to go to New York and I see signs for Florida. Well, I know I'm getting closer to New York. All right. Uh, as we get closer to the second coming, we're not going to be, you know, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, I should say. As we're seeing signs for that thing, we know we got to be getting closer to the rapture. And I mean, the signs for the, the time of Jacob's trouble are just like, <sighs> I used to collect them. I'd collect them in the newspaper. I'd print the articles out and stuff like that. I don't even bother anymore. There's so many signs now. It's just, it's, it's insane. I mean, I don't understand the minds of atheists. I mean, they're just that wicked, I guess, that they reject the Lord. But the fact is, it's just like, how can you reject the Bible anymore? It's just as plain as the nose on your face. I mean, prophecy is being revealed. I mean, wow. It's incredible. I don't think we're going to see the grave, brethren. I think if you're alive today, unless you're, you know, on death's doorstep and going to be losing your life in the next couple of months or something, you know, they're only being given a couple of weeks to live or something like that, uh, I think if you're in reasonably good shape, I think you're going to be going up. And what a day that's going to be. I'll tell you what, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on in my life right now and a lot of things that come up and, a lot of neat plans for the future and whatever else. You know, I'm looking forward to it. You know, the snow going away here. I mean, we just, you know, I love snow, but it's like, you know, <laughs> we get a lot of it here in the northeastern part of Maine. Uh, I know I have brothers and sisters that live here in Maine, and many of you have contacted me and, like, laughing about it. You know, yeah, you know, you're getting the snow now, aren't you? Yeah, a lot more than Pennsylvania. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the spring. I'm looking forward to getting outside and doing some work out there and, you know, getting to the property and starting to work over there and getting the lane fixed up. And I, You know, I have plans for the future. But I never want to let my love for seeing the Lord and for being together with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I never want to let anything here on this earth supersede that. In my heart of hearts, I'd like the rapture to happen right now. Tonight, just forget the whole mess. Somebody can come in and have a good time with the books here. They'll probably be burned, or I, I have no idea. You know, um, I don't know, but I do know we're getting close. We're getting real close, and uh, so most of us probably aren't going to have to make arrangements for burial or, you know, don't do the cremation thing. But uh, you know, most of us. I'd say let's just, you know, I believe the best situation, the best solution to the thing of the, the rapture is let's just get as active as we can witnessing to the lost world, preaching and teaching the lost. Let's get out there. Let's have charity for these people. Help them to realize 
there's only one flight out of what's coming to this world. And if you're not on that flight, you're going to go into the worst time period ever in history. If you are lost and watching this thing, you are headed for, I mean, literal hell on earth. I mean, the Bible talks about the, the pale rider that comes in Revelation chapter 6. It says that death and hell followed him. It will literally be hell on earth. When all the saints, when all the Christians are gone, when we're removed. But, you know, if you want to be here for that, well, the Bible says about the, you know, graves are opened there when Jesus goes up the first time. I think the graves are going to be opened at the rapture. So, hey, there'll be plenty of new open graves there, you know, for all the bodies that are going to go in at the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, so that's going to be the study on uh, the subject of cremation or burial. Cremation is not an option. After studying this thing, after looking at it from all the angles and everything else, cremation is just not sanctioned in the pages of the King James Bible. No way. Cremation is not an option. Burial Yes. I would stay away from the whole funeral home scam thing. I would try to look into ways to do it much cheaper. If you have some land, you know, check into being, being buried on your own land. People did it for thousands of years. You know, all of a sudden we can't do it anymore or something like this. Whatever. You know, I'd check into doing that. So let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you for teaching me about this subject. I'm, I was just as ignorant as anybody else on this issue. And, and I really didn't know what your word said. But after looking at it, it's just crystal clear, Lord. Burial is the way to go. And Lord, I do pray for any brother or sister out there that's having to make these plans, that there's a loved one that's dying or that has died. I pray, Lord, that you would lead them into ways that they can bury their loved one on their own land and not have to go through all the expenses of funeral homes and everything else. Just really praying, Lord, that you would please give each of us the wisdom that we need uh, to live here in this world in these last days. And I, I just really pray, too, Lord, for courage for all of us that, that uh, we would be bold with our witnessing and, and that we would stay true to you right up until... You call us out of here, Lord, and, and I do pray, Lord, that you would hasten that day when we can go to see you for the very first time and to be uh, united with our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and never more to part. And I just ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be it for that study. Um, I think probably next week we're going to be doing a expository study of the book of Philemon. Chapter 1, we're not going to do chapter 2 or 3. It's a little joke there, folks. Um, from there, I'm not sure what we're going to do. Maybe expository study of... I have more subjects to do, I'm saying. But as far as expository studies, I'm not sure where I'm going to go. Open to some suggestions there. Possible books to do expository studies on. But um, we'll try to do that. And uh, like I said, there's a bunch of very good... Uh, sermon requests that I'm going to be covering as we continue on here. There's a bunch of little short videos, a bunch of um, other things that I need to get done. So please keep us in your prayers and um, I guess we'll, we'll see you next week. Till then, may the Lord be with you and keep you in His Word and stay faithful to the things that God has showed you. So that's it. Thank you for watching.